speaking uh, when uh, Senator Murphy, they're in a Senate regulated industries meetings. I don't know what's happened this year, but I swear to goodness, uh, I talked to some of my committee. They had uh, three or four meetings backed up, huh? Yes, I see Senator Ligon. We're going to get him. And uh, Bruce, we'll, we'll, we'll let you come up in a few minutes when we get started on that other one. And here's the uh, cripple. Bless his heart. Uh, yeah, we, I, I've met, I just met Bruce, sir. Sure did. Thank everyone for being here. Uh, Lord willing, this will be the last, last regulated industries of the year uh, committee meeting. And I don't see my buddy here. Uh, I was going to recognize a former chairman of this committee. Former, he was a former vice chair. We had a committee dinner last night and let him say a few words. But uh, if y'all get a chance to see uh, uh, Representative Carl Von Epps, he's retiring after this year, uh, much to uh, our uh, sorrow. Uh, he's been a great member on this committee, been here 22 years, I believe, probably served on this committee most of that time. He was chairman at least four years, I believe, and vice chair, six or eight years. But uh, if he comes in, we'll recognize him. But I wanted to say a few words about his service. Uh, this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get started in our meeting. Lord, we do thank you for this day. Thank you for the uh, representatives here representing the people of the state of Georgia. Lord, we ask you to uh, give us a clarity of thought and uh, a good decision-making with decisions we have to make. We thank you for the state of Georgia. We thank you for the communities we represent. We thank you for these good folks being here for this meeting today. We just pray, Lord, that uh, all we do would be uh, in your, for, your, for your name and your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Senator Murphy, as I said, is still chairing a Senate uh, regulated industries meeting. But Senator Ligdon, I got your message late a while ago. I appreciate you coming in, sir. I've been running, I'm probably sure like you, a, a crazy man today off and on, Senate rules and everywhere else. But if you'd come up and uh, present your propositions to us, we heard these in subcommittee on Monday, and they recommend, they, they got a due pass out of the sub, subcommittee that uh, Chairman Dixon, you chaired that uh, great meeting, didn't you, sir? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right, uh, you want to take up uh, Senate Bill 336, Senator? I think they should be in the folders. Let me get you on. I'm sorry. That okay. Work? I think so. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Sir. Chairman. Uh, these bills were uh, brought because we had been receiving complaints from uh, barbers and uh, cosmetologists in our area. And also, as uh, I began to hear from other representatives and senators in other areas, and in fact, uh, uh, Representative Coleman had called me, and we talked about this, problems that he were having in, in his area where our barbers and cosmetologists were just being hit with huge, huge fines. For example, uh, you know, the, the, in a barber shop, they'll have the, the sanitation solution that they'll dip a comb in. Well, if the cover was off, that would be a fine of $500. And cosmetologists, if the door to the towels were left open, another $500. I mean, some of these that had been in business 30, 40, 50 years have never, that have never had a problem. We're being hit with fines of, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, and then to appeal those, they would have to go um, to Macon. I mean, there's no other place in the state for them to go, and that would require people who are not making a lot of money to take another day from work and go in and deal with that. And there just hadn't seemed seemed to be a response to that. And and when you looked at the level of fines that were being implemented, uh, assessed against them. A person could could get a DUI in many instances and be fined less than some of these people. And so, what the bill does uh, right now, the bill provides for a fine not to exceed five hundred dollars. And if there's a violation of a board rule, it sets caps on the first offense, a fine of twenty-five dollars; for the second offense, a fine of seventy-five dollars; and for a third of offense, a fine. Uh, up to, I meant to say up to, the 2575 and, and for the third offense, $300. Now, you're talking to your, your bill that's changing on uh, page 2, lines yes, on 30 page two. through 34. Lines 30 through 34. That's what it does. Um, other, if someone's practicing without a license or committing fraud, things like that, the maximum fine would still be $50. But these operational-type things where 
um, they should be given a warning first or a small fine. It sets those limits um, it within the statute uh, for the, the amounts that I've just mentioned. Uh, and now you mentioned $50. It's $500. I mean, $500. Yes. If I but, said 50 I meant 500 Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's, and currently, the, the board for each fine, they can access up to $500 for each that's violation right. they find when they go there. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. All right. So $500 fine for, I guess, egregious violations that you're listed here on 18 through 26. 28. Yeah, 28 is on the back page. Yes, sir. And then without those, it goes into the three categories, 25, 75, and 300. Yes, any, sir. Any questions from the committee to the author of the bill here? Glad to have you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman Dixon? I would move do pass for... Senate Bill 336. Moving second. Any questions now at the committee? All right. If not, all in favor, they will say an aye. Aye. Any opposed, like sign. And who's going to be carrying these for you, sir? Uh, the cosmetologist would be Senator At uh, Representative Atwood. And uh, then on, well, we, I guess we need to get 337. Well, we go ahead at 337. Yes, right. sir. Go ahead and 337. The, the, the same principles apply, apply for 337 as for 336. Uh, if you look at lines 31 through 36, it's setting caps uh, a fine of up to $25 for a first violation, up to $75 for a second, and up to $300 for a third violation. If you get into the more uh, serious issues, then those caps still remain at $500. Okay. Questions from the committee on 337? Chairman Dixon. Move do pass for House, uh, excuse me, Senate Bill 337. 337, do pass. Got a second. All in favor, let me say an aye. aye. Any opposed, like sign. All right, Senator. I think Representative Coleman would, I mean, would carry this I, one. Representative Coleman? Brooks, yes, sir, Brooks Coleman. Brooks Coleman. Yes, sir. All right, maybe he'll have a little <laughs> hair left after today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, sir. We Thank appreciate you. it. They'll be heading the rules. Senator Murphy, did you do good work for us over in the Senate uh, regulated industries? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I don't even want to talk about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, the last few days, you know, we get into real train wrecks, and we had one today, but. Uh, Representative Dixon's bill is on the way. Is it? Uh, you know, uh, as we discuss. Uh, but we had a, a few little, you know, blips in there. Um, what I want to do is bring to you today Senate Bill 294. This is a bill that we discussed in the subcommittee the other day. And it is, uh, I believe, 362545S. Um, now, okay, we had a sub come up on that yesterday. Have you, you talked to some gentlemen, I believe, and we had a substitute on that, striking, striking a line down there? Yes. Okay. This is a new sub, 362555S. Okay. That's a good number. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we just struck the uh, struck the a uh, couple of pieces of language. If I could ask Sean Marie to uh, tell me what those were. It had uh, something to do with just a couple of lines there in the language. Show me what's your number, ma'am. Lucky number 13. 13. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the changes were made on uh, page 5 in subsection E. And essentially, um, starting at line 149 down to 162 we just restored the language that had been struck in with regard to the office location so it puts back what the current law is okay one say those numbers again 150 uh, it's lines it's in subsection e mm -hmm. in lines 149 ending on line 162 
Okay. And we just unstruck and we had the a language. Of, yeah, we had like three lines we'd added in there, and we took that out and left it original. That's correct. Okay. So it takes it back to what the current law is. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Apologize, Mr. Chairman. That was a uh, late amendment that uh, came in yesterday, and we had that uh, added that on. It doesn't really affect the bill uh, that much. It just takes it back to the original. What we did on this bill is uh, <clears throat> the main purpose of the bill is to allow Class One, Class Two electricians to be able to uh, do a lot of things with low voltage now that they can't do. Um, here before, they hadn't been able to. Uh, a class one or a class two hadn't been able to even wire a doorbell or put in low voltage lighting uh, and that would be track lighting so you're going to have an office building built and you want to have a little track lighting put behind your desk you'd have to call in a separate contractor to get that done these electricians can, call, can install 14,000 volts and but you say well I can't put that in I gotta call a separate contractor that makes the consumer think man what's going on here you know you're just swapping off uh, and so we can make some money. So this bill corrects that, corrects a lot of that. It allows them to lo do low voltage lighting. It allows them to pull the wire on a lot of things that they wasn't able to do, such as phone wires, such as data connections, things like that. It allows them to do a lot of things that they uh, couldn't do before. Uh, and we had an agreement with the low voltage people that they're they're in agreement with that. Uh, they gave some on that, and the electricians gained some on some things that they wasn't allowed to do, uh, which helps them out. The things that they're still not allowed to do is actually co connect the devices, such as the burglar alarm or the fire systems. And uh, the low voltage people have some problems with that because they are afraid that uh, they don't have the expertise in connecting these fire uh, systems and, and they think it could be a safety hazard. And of course, in burglar alarms, you got certain codes and stuff like that that you got to, that security codes, uh, security systems. And so they can't connect the devices. They can run the wire to the devices, which would be done in pre-construction and what it should be done. Uh, so that's, that's what this bill does, is allow them some latitude on being able to uh, pull the wires and run the wires they need to and put in low voltage lighting and and uh, doorbells and things like that that uh, that the customer don't understand that you can't put in. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator Murphy. We got three people that was going to speak today that couldn't make it here Monday for our hearing. So if, we, if you would, uh, let me just say okay. before that I do that, that that we sat down with the low voltage people, you know, and came to an agreement on this. Okay. Now the electricians. They still wanted the whole, they wanted a lot more, but you know, we wouldn't, uh, uh, we didn't go that far. So, but we came to a, an agreement with uh, Representative Dixon and all in a, in a conference room down there and they agreed to the, to this bill. So before they speak, Mr. Chairman, I, now, I think you got a question. Just a second, sir. Representative Flood, you have a question, sir? I do, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Murphy, you're saying that the electricians would be able to run the wire to the device, the local voltage wire. Right. Um, if they're not able to connect the wire to the device, and then they would not be able to test it to see if it actually is operational. Is that correct? No, they would have to call in the uh, low voltage, a low voltage person to uh, technician to or electrician to connect that, and then of course if it's not working correctly, then they would get back uh, uh, in touch with the electricians that pull the wire. So the, both the electrician and the low voltage person would still be engaged or involved in. in They'd have in the to losses. be engaged, yeah. If if it's not working properly, they'd have to get the uh, get back with the yes. electrician. If they couldn't find the problem, which might be simple, you know, to find, but if they can't find it, they'd have to get get back in touch with the electrician that did the wiring. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. That's the only question we have at this time. Uh, got a couple of folks that had asked, uh, couldn't make it Monday. So, uh, Mr. William Bruce Bowman, if you'd come up, my friend, talk to us a minute. If you'd step over here, sir. I understand you have a guest with you today that's hobbling around. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to ask that uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, 
Loud, Mr. Loud, uh, speak first because he had some introductory remarks okay. that he would like to make first, and then I would like to follow him. Okay, sir. We'll do Thank that. You. John? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Give, give us your name and who you represent, John. Yes, sir. Um, my name is John Loud. I'm actually president of Loud Security Systems based up in uh, Kennesaw, Georgia. I'm a past president of the State Alarm Association, GELSA, which is the Georgia Electronic Life Safety and and uh, Systems Association um, with us. We've got a few other members and the current president is with us also, but I'd like to share a few remarks and, and certainly thank Senator Murphy, uh, excuse me, <laughs> uh, Senator Murphy for the meetings that he has allowed us to have and, and get some of these uh, uh, discussions together, Chairman Dixon and the subcommittee and how we're able to formulate some, some things there. And, um, one thing I'd like to share, I started my company about 19 years ago and I was a flight attendant with Delta Airlines. And the only reason why I share that is because I promise you, low voltage is a nice, simple thing. High voltage is a scary thing because I would not be alive if I dabbled in the, the high voltage part of this. So you'll, you'll see where we're very supportive and very understanding as to what it is that the electricians are not allowed to do and very supportive and cooperative to make sure that on a legal aspect, they've been doing this for years and now I think we've got a good compromise underway here to help move this forward. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the change going from an LVU to an LVG. An LVU, which was unrestricted, really let a lot of concerns that get into a lot of life safety factors. Uh, Representative Taylor had carried a bill for us the last two years regarding enhanced call verification that passed last year, and that requires two calls before dispatch. Um, to give you some numbers, there are 1,974 unrestricted low voltage license holders as of March 2014. There are over 9,000 electricians, class one and class two combined. So where our concern ultimately sits is when the governor passes a bill that ultimately adds 9,000 low voltage holders as to what category of restrictions, heeds a lot of concern and caution, not only from the jurisdiction and the false dispatch aspects, which is an inevitable, because once they hold the license, as Senator Murphy shared with us uh, as we were talking that, you know, somebody is still going to go to a fire alarm company or a burglar alarm company or a telecom company for those services. And ultimately, I think that's relatively correct. But the concern becomes when somebody has this license, they now can represent themselves to a building owner, to a homeowner, to be a whole lot more because they now carry a low voltage license. Um, with the numbers of 9,000 plus compared to 1,974 and the breakdown in that area be, there's four classifications. Okay, and within Georgia there are four classifications because they're very distinct and very different. Unrestricted covers it all. A for alarm, so LVA for alarm only, those folks can only do alarm. LVT for telecom and LVG for general. And I'm going to inform you, if you will, for one, I'm going to read the description of general because it's important to understand why we've all come to the, to the compromise of general low voltage systems mean any electrical system other than alarm or telecommunication systems involving low voltage wiring as defined in code uh, 43, 14, so forth, I, the language is in there, including but not limited to the standalone intercom systems, call alert systems, and what I'm reading, this is what the electricians and the low voltage folks can do. So by doing this bill and passing it, this is what we're allowing everybody to do, which is great. They're going to be able to do distribution wiring for alarm systems and telecommunication systems, including local area network systems, sound systems, public address systems, Here's a key one, the low voltage side of energy management systems, antenna systems, and satellite dish systems. They can do irrigation systems wiring and all low voltage um, lighting. Now, Representative Clay, the question you brought is, if an electrician goes to pull that low voltage wire, they're ultimately, as Senator Murphy would share, they're ultimately looking to connect the high voltage systems. So they wouldn't per se have to call a low voltage contractor. If they started to get beyond the energy management side of it, then they will have to engage a low voltage contractor to make sure that the, uh, the control systems become properly installed and initiated and managed. Because again, that's where you get into the fire systems, you get into elevator recall, you get into HVAC interactions. These low voltage systems go a lot more than just uh, pulling a piece of wire, so it becomes a, a distinct difference from that area. Um, when someone does low voltage alarm work, you know they do work under NFPA 72, Life Safety 101. These books will be presented to you, I believe, here shortly. So I'm going to let that be. Um, but the thing we really want to ask today, and we discussed this in our, our smaller group meeting, is with the idea of, of extending 9,000 licenses to folks, under Section 4314 right now, the CEUs annually by the code, and here's what it is, and there's five categories under this section. Low voltage is one category with four subtitles underneath. But the other four, there are CEU requirements for electricians, 
It says, with respect to electrical contractor class one and two license, the division of electrical contractors shall be authorized to require persons seeking renewal of licenses to complete board approval, continuing education of not more than four hours annually. That language is duplicated with throughout this for the electricians, for the utility contractors, for the plumbers, and for the HVAC contractors. And what we would like to see added into this bill is that simple piece of language that if we're going to uh, allow 9,000 licenses to be issued under the G classifications that we also request CEUs to be incorporated for all four categories. Now, in meeting with Representative Dix Dixon on an off day up in his district, and we appreciate very much with he and Representative Broderick to meet with us, one concern he shared with us is, what does the Secretary of State's office feel about this? So when we came down to meet, uh, we went in to the Secretary of State's office and met with Chuck Harper for a little while. He is the Secretary of State Legislative Affairs Director. Okay, that's Mr. Harper's title. Had a good 20 minute plus meeting with him. Um, Secretary of State Brian Kemp kind of had walked through the room two or three times. He finally stopped, asked what we were talking about. We brought this issue to him. He sat down and spent about another 20 minutes with us. And he heard kind of from where it was in the House and the Senate side and what had gone on, where the concerns were going into the life safety factor. And we're saying, hey, we're willing to accept the same compromise to say every low voltage classification to provide four CEUs, which we agree enhances the public safety, certainly the professional aspects of the, uh, the industry as a whole, but just the concern of when you add 9,000 licenses by a, a signature, it should be at least something to, to give a check on there. Um, Secretary of State Brian Kemp said uh, he understood how he would probably be able to deal with it the first year, and I'll share with you flat out what he said, is that I probably likely would have to go back next year and ask for a little something different from appropriations from the funding part of it. But he said if it is brought forth in a compromise and this is part of it, I will support it at this time to move the bill forward to get it passed. Let me ask you a question, sir. Y'all have had this Class G low voltage contracting has been in place. How many years do you think? Uh, 30? Yeah. 30 years. 84. 84. I was 84. Since 84. 84. But we've never had, at that period of time, th this group has never had any continuing education credits required for the last 30 years then. Is that correct? It has been brought through, forward through GORC in the past, but it had not been, has never been but, but, put in place. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Does it occur? Um, in the, you know what, Lee, that's a great question. Does it occur? There are CEUs offered within the state, on the internet, and throughout. It's, since it's not required, not every contractor does it. Many contractors and probably many uh, that do do attend those. There's not a cost factor. I want to be clear on that. So we're not asking anybody to take due burden financial expense. We're also not asking for every member of the company to follow CEUs, only the license holder and other adjourning states, they require this. The salespeople, the installers, I mean, we're asking to say, let's make the license holder who's ultimately accountable for that business operating to be the one that's got the knowledge. And when we deal with uh, Representative Taylor's thing from enhanced call verification, that is a great continuing education class to understand what law just changed, how it affects public policy, how it affects life safety from the officer's dispatch, and reduces costs for any jurisdiction to not have false alarms go more rampant than where they are today. Okay. I, I appreciate you bringing that forward, and I was in contact with some of the low-voltage people today. We'll, we'll let you get back up in just a moment, Senator, if you don't mind. But I personally would think that would be something we should have brought through the Secretary of State's office and through the low-voltage contracting board as a requirement that they would present to us. In, in, in going forward with this, John. I mean, I just. One of my concerns with that, if I may, is that I could see next year if all of a sudden 9,000 electricians are allowed to have this license, why would they or their lobbyists be encouraging and supporting to say, sure, willing to accept four more CEUs? And now we've just allowed them to kind of run go free with no proficiency, no testing, no nothing from but, the back. But now you, you guys had agreed earlier that what we were going to be doing was running the wire, not installing. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to just get, get my head around what you were talking about up here. You all had agreed that on lines 25 through lines 32 over here, basically at the top of, of 28, 29, and 30 on page 2, that they could pull wire but not, in, not do the installation, alteration, service, repair of an alarm system device or switching system associated. I'm just trying to make sure. Uh, you know, it, this I don't remember this coming up in our, our Monday hearing. It was not in there. It was, and here's where the concern, and uh, Dan Gordon and, and others have echoed this, is that when we go to pull a permit, the jurisdiction, they 
barely understand what a G-U-T-A, I mean, the laws have been passed here, and I probably guess that not everybody in the room understands. So even when we go to do code enforcement, it's not typically usually followed. And again, I think to give any license to 9,000 folks to just say, and they're used to doing four CEUs electrically, mm -hmm. so I don't see how it would be such a, a bad thing to say, hey, let's just ask for four CEUs from a low voltage standpoint. And again, we're willing to say, hey, we're, we're right on board with the same thing. Okay, thank you much. Thank you. All right, Bruce, you wanna come forward now, sir? <clears throat> And some of the committee members are going to, have to be getting out here shortly because the education meeting is going to be starting. I know they've got three bills they're taking up first. I've asked them for to, to, to go ahead and take this. <clears throat> yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Bruce Bowman. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer with Fox Systems up in Calhoun, Georgia. And uh, <clears throat> I also was appointed to serve on the low voltage uh, licensing board uh, by Governor Purdue, and have been serving on that board since. Um, and when I first saw uh, Senator uh, Murphy's uh, bill, SB 294, um, you know, it, it appeared to me that uh, the way it was written was going to uh, basically uh, circumvent the whole low voltage licensing process. When we go through the applicants for a low voltage license, we look at uh, ver uh, experience verification, that they have experience in alarms if they're getting an LVA, or they have experience with telecommunications if they're getting an LVT, or if they're getting LVG, that they have that experience. And also for unrestricted, it's you know you have to prove experience in more than one area. So we go we we, we take a lot of pains uh, to go through those applications to make sure and verify that those people have experiences in these fields. We also uh, have them test for uh, knowledge in that field. And I'm a I also have uh, besides being a professional engineer. I also have a low voltage, I mean, excuse me, a class two unrestricted license. So I've, I've taken the uh, test for that as well. And when you take, when you take the uh, exam for class two electrical license, it's based on the National Electrical Code, which is NFPA 70. Okay, when you, when you take the uh, LVA, uh, then you're, you're expected to uh, be tested on uh, NFPA 72 which is the uh, low voltage, or which is the alarm system uh, document. This book is not referenced at all on the class two unrestricted license uh, for Georgia. And also, uh, um, just as importantly as uh, for Life Safety 101, uh, that document is not referenced at all uh, for the class two unrestricted uh, license as well. So you see that there's a big gaping hole in uh, experience verification and in knowledge of, of, of a class two uh, contractor uh, trying to do alarm work and and that um, is going to uh, potentially harm the citizens of Georgia and that's the purpose in 1984 when we came up with the low voltage license requirements was to protect the citizens of Georgia against uh, unexperienced or unknowledgeable people in these areas. Um, I, I think that the compromise bill that, uh, that I've been looking at when it says uh, that general system low voltage contracting means the low voltage wiring of any electrical system including an alarm system or a telecommunication system and the installation, alteration, service, or repair of a general system provided however that such terms shall not include the installation, alteration, service, or repair of an alarm system device or the switching system and associated apparatus of a telecommunication system. That this uh, requirement or uh, a definition of a low voltage uh, contractor um, makes it even more complicated to the general public because they don't know the difference between an LVG and an LVT and an LVU and an LVA now, you know, much less if uh, if this passes uh, the way that, it, that it's written. Uh, and when you have 9,000 electrical contractors who 
are going to be issued an LVG license and that there will be no continuing education requirements attached to that, then not only do they have they not shown experience or knowledge in that field now, but they're going to be uh, practicing this. Uh, and even if even you won't be able to differentiate between a company like mine, uh, Fox Systems, that has we do lo uh, ninety percent of what we do is electrical contracting. 10% of what we do is low voltage contracting. We hold both licenses. So no matter which way these bills go, it's not going to affect my company personally. Uh, uh, but, but serving on the low voltage licensing board, I see how it can affect uh, the low voltage contractors in the state because, you know, you're going to open it up to a lot of... Uh, folks who have not demonstrated experience, who have not demonstrated knowledge uh, in, the, in these areas. And if, the, if I understand it right, the 9,000 folks that are electrical contractors are going to be given an LVG license now. And so they're holding two licensures. And, uh, you know, how, how are we going to differentiate between the electrical contractor and the low voltage contractor who is experienced and and who, who uh, d has done the due diligence to uh, be proficient and knowledgeable about the uh, alarm systems and the life safety systems that they're putting in. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bowman. Questions for Mr. Bowman? Uh, let, let me ask you, so you, you're on the low voltage board now? I am. Did you serve with a gentleman named Al Scales for a number of years? Albert Scales? I, I know of him, yes, sir. He got off last January, I believe. Yeah. And uh, I, I had him appointed back about seven, eight years ago. He was a chief electrical inspector out of Cobb County for a number of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to deal with uh, Charles McMurtry over there now. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's the other gentleman <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sure do. Uh, yeah. We've got a question, line 19. Chairman Dix. Do you have any estimate of how many of those who already have a Class two license actually already hold a uh, low voltage certification also? I do not. Um, I would think mm. it would be a very small number, but I don't know. Okay. Representative Jeff Bob. Uh, uh, be, uh, let me d just, uh, Representative Dixon, let me, uh, let me respond to that this way. I am, a, I am a registered professional engineer, and I am a, a, a licensed electrical contractor, class two unrestricted. And uh, my own personal knowledge uh, is, is in the electrical contracting side of it. Our company, about 10% of the volume of our, our work, and we do about $14 million a year, uh, is, is low voltage. And we have a low voltage division person that runs that division. And his name is uh, Scott Gregg, and he's a NYSET 4 certified uh, a low voltage uh, uh, person. I, I could not do uh, what he does. Uh, I, I don't understand the programming of alarm panels. I don't understand a lot of the details of NFPA 72 or NFPA 101 life safety because I haven't dealt, I, I don't have that experience. Uh, my, my end, like uh, 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 <clears throat> Senator Murphy was talking about, on the high voltage side, you know, I, I'm, I'm more with power distribution and with industrial systems like that. Thank you. It, it, in the, the subcommittee meeting, though, the electrical contractors who were there indicated that there was a significant number of electrical contractors who, who as, a, as a company, maintained both certifications because for the same reason that your company does. Yes. Yeah, I... I I, I don't know what that number is. Uh, that'd be an interesting number to know. But uh, I know I know that uh, uh, in my own little neck of the woods up there in northwest Georgia, I'm not aware of many contractors that have both. Do you have a question, um, sir? Yes, sir. Um, my, yeah. Bruce Bowman. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not not sure, but the two ways that a person would become an electrician would probably be either be through the union apprentice program or a tech school that that would provide that basic background. Do not they go into low voltage 
in their training? They would have to specialize uh, in that area. Um, th there are some aspects of low voltage that is in the National Electrical Code. Uh, I think uh, someone has pointed out that, you know, part of this book deals with low voltage, and, and that is true. It has class one, class two uh, low voltage systems, but it's very minimal. Uh, you know, you can compare compare <clears throat> Life Safety 101 and NFPA 72 to this book here. You can see that there's there's obviously a lot more information than than uh, is in that uh, curriculum that's uh, that that's part of the electrical. Um, before I came to Fox Systems uh, in 1998, for the previous 19 years, I was electrical technology instructor at Dalton State College, and at Walker Tech, which is now Georgia Northwestern Technical College up in Rock Spring, Georgia. And uh, in all of those years of teaching, I taught the National Electric Code, I taught electrical systems, motor controls, PLCs, but never did I teach uh, alarm systems, uh, security systems, access control, burglar systems, uh, fire alarm systems. That was not part of the curriculum. Uh, and it was a two-year associate degree uh, program. And I also have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's degree in electrical engineering. And, there, and, and none of my curriculum ever dealt with uh, those systems in particular. Okay. I, I appreciate you teaching up in my district. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. Well, okay. Now, your, your discussion, that is what I'm hearing out of you, Mr. Bowman, is that they're going to be installing all these systems. But you read through that section on lines 20. Eight and twenty-nine. They're not going to be installing. They're just going to be pulling wire on this stuff. Now, <clears throat> is that? Yeah, that's that's that's, that's correct. That's your concern. I mean, it, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, this. my my concern would be that uh, that folks will not be able to differentiate between the uh, low voltage general license holder uh, and any other low voltage license, because the you know when you when you look at the uh, LVG being given to the 9,000, and that's what, is, is that the way, the way I read it and understand this bill is that, is that those 9,000 electrical contractors are going to receive an LVG license as a result of this bill. Is that not correct? Uh, up to the extent they can pull wire. But, I mean, that's what an LVG would authorize them to do. Okay. Pull wire. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 not, and install... Uh, systems that are not alarm or telecommunications. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Not al yeah. Yeah. That's correct. That's what I. That's what I understand and about it. And and, and, and my concern. and my concern is is that people are not going to be able to differentiate between one low voltage license and another because they can't now. You know, and, and it's been around for thirty years. We've had this since nineteen eighty four. Representative Dixon. If they can't now and they won't be able to in the future, this bill's not going to have any impact on that. <clears throat> well, uh, no, you're, you're right. It won't have any impact on that except that the person who gets a low voltage license has to do either an LVG general or an LVA alarm or an LVT telecommunications or an LVU unrestricted. And that's the way it's been for the last 30 years. Right. I mean, the, but the public doesn't understand that now. We're not changing anything that's going to make it any more complicated because we're not changing those codes at all. But you're incorporating it into now you've just opened it up to 9,000 more contractors. So the confusion is now, instead of being amongst the uh, 14,000 low voltage license contractors, now it's 23,000 because you've added 9,000 electrical contractors to okay, the list. Let me ask you this question then. Do you really think that there's going to be any more electrical contractors doing low voltage wiring in the future than there are right now? Because as a result of this bill? As a result of this bill. Because yeah. most, most folks a in, a, in, a, in a residential environment, most folks, uh, the electrician who wires the house is, is pulling the the alarm wire for the for the I mean not the alarm wire but the doorbell he's doing track lighting for you if you if you need it that's what he's going to be authorized to do under this I, I mean I don't see yeah. where 
Well, I, I mean, besides opening it up to the other 9,000 and broadening the scope or the number of folks that have the confusion, I think you're right. I think your point is well taken. But what, what we need in order to uh, uh, put some um, credibility into these LVGs is the continuing education element. If we add the continuing education element to it, then in order for an electrical contractor to maintain his LVG status, he's going to have to do the continuing education, so he's going to be getting some training in the area of... Uh, when we worked out the compromise that became this bill, part of that compromise was that we, we assured that we would work on a CEU bill in the next session. At this late date, it's difficult to put that kind of language into a bill. Yeah, yeah. How about a, a study? Put it into a study and bring it up for next year. What question, uh, Representative Rutledge? Wave. Representative Deffenbaugh, Ball, another question. Uh, I'm not sure I un understand what you said versus what. I understood the chairman to say when these electrical class one and two people they are you you're, you're saying they're automatically going to have the low voltage certification that's the way I understand the bill the way it's written so they don't need to get another certification or another license they they're just in it so that, that, that's included with no training, with no anything. That's correct. That is correct. So that's different than what I understood to be said. All right, we have another speaker on this. Any further okay. questions for uh, I'll, Bruce? I'll wave the rest Did you get that? Yes, sir. I'm going to be right behind you in a moment. I'll turn this over to Vice Chair Taylor in a minute. We've got another speaker. Is there any more okay. questions for Mr. Bowman? All right, we're going to call up uh, Mr. Morris at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming down today, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Keith Morris. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to speak to you. Uh, I am a low voltage contractor here in Georgia for ooh, 13 years. Uh, been a low voltage contractor and in the industry here for about 35 years, and I carry 18 licenses in different states. So I'm very familiar with licensing issues, CEUs, and these two books, which are literally in my industry, the Bibles, 101 and 72. I can do low voltage install and design fire alarm systems, burglar alarm systems, camera systems, access control, but I won't touch a 110 volt circuit or system. Not trained on it, not familiar with them. Uh, I represent the Automatic Fire Alarm Association here in Georgia, which is a group of fire alarm contractors throughout the state, and our one chapter, it's about 50, 55 members, our national organization uh, is in 36 different states. We sit on NFPA committees and boards, code writing, uh, standards committees, as such. Uh, our only our concern with this bill, as the way we knew it and have heard of it, is that it's going to allow electrical contractors a G license or an, a U license to pull and design install fire alarm systems, security systems that uh, right now we have specialty training for. And uh, a lot of it has to do with life safety issues. Uh, I met yesterday with Dwayne Garrison uh, and Randy Valrith with the state fire, mar he's the state fire marshal and his assistant. And last week we met uh, the state fire marshal's office with uh, Jay Florence from his office as well. Uh, the state fire marshal's office was is a, is not it, uh, was against this bill the way it was originally written, allowing electrical contractors to get involved in life safety systems. Uh, everyone's talking pulling wires. Pulling wires was great, but 
the alarm systems also have to be designed, and they're usually designed by a licensed contractor. Uh, our concern is to make sure that electrical contractors don't, don't just get allowed a U or an A license or a T even uh, that will allow them to, to design as well as install alarm systems. Right now, electrical contractors install alarm systems for us all the time. As a sub, sub, we subcontracted them, they subcontract us to pull wires. That's not and never is a problem. Uh, we work together hand in hand in the industry with them. Uh, but the design for the systems, which is what the license holder will be doing, comes from the U or the NYSET certification uh, for the fire alarm or security contractor through NTS 1, 2 certifications. Uh, the NTS is a security industry that allows re, uh, the CEUs, recurring CEUs and recurring training on alarm systems as well as NYSET, which is a fire alarm industry uh, certification. So, uh, so, so what, I, what I understand you saying, Mr. Morris, is that basically we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist here. Is that what I heard you say? As, as long as the electrical contractors are not in designing and pulling contracts, uh, permits for fire and security systems, or working on life safety systems, there's really no problem there. But as, as we read the bill originally, and I've heard that electrical contractors will be allowed to pull permits for low voltage systems, uh, if they're getting involved in life safety systems, fire alarm, security, then, then there would be an issue there. If they have a G license that lets them pull track lighting and thermostat wiring, there's no problem there. But That's if, okay. They do that anyway, residential or commercial. But they're pulling the wire for the alarm systems and the uh, switching systems. Well, sir, it, it goes a little beyond pulling wire. It, it, it goes more to pulling permits. Okay. It's pulling permits for the wiring. And pulling permits for the wiring goes a little deeper than that because now you're getting into the des designing of the system and who's qualified to pull a permit to design and design an engineered system. Okay. Uh, which a lot of these class two electricians don't have training or background in. Uh, we have another question. Just a moment, sir. Mr. Rutledge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming down and educating us on this. Um, if I started today, how long would it take me to get a low voltage license? Uh, at least a year. A year? If I was a class one electrician, how long would it take me to get a license? If you, I guess, according to the statutes here, if you have the projects. Well, well, this is not in law yet. No, well, according to the existing contracts. That's what I'm asking. The, the existing statutes. If you have the projects, it would be sitting for a test and taking the test to get a low voltage license. Was it twice a year? I think twice a year they, they offer the test. So if I held a class one electrician's license right now, I could go take a test and be certified as a, as if, a low if voltage. You, if you've done the required installations for your low voltage license. Okay. A certain number of low voltage installations. Right. I don't, is, is there a number? Three. Got to have three installed and take the test. Right. Okay. And then, right, and six for unrestricted. Can we go to the education meeting now? <laughs> All right, any further questions for this gentleman? All right, Senator, you want to come back and talk to us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doug. You know, um, with all due respect to Mr. Loud, we sat in the uh, conference room downstairs uh, with Representative Dixon. And I uh, told him that we wasn't going to go with the CEUs this year because the Secretary of State just absolutely doesn't have time to put the CEUs in place. And they've been licensed, low voltage licenses have been uh, around since 1984, 30 years, and all of a sudden we need CEUs. We don't know how many of this 9,000 that we're talking about putting on already has uh, low voltage license. And what, I'm ta what I've heard and talked to, a lot of the electricians already have low voltage license uh, that where they can do you know some of this work already. Um, so we did agree that I wouldn't put that on. Isn't that right, Mr. Lowe? 
Okay, we agreed on that in the conference, and then they're coming back and want CEUs. We, we can do it next year. I said we can come back and look at the CEUs next, next year. Plus, your Class 1, your Class 2 licenses already have CEUs. And as, as these gentlemen have testified, which I really appreciate them giving us some knowledge here, in those books right there, in those tests and study materials, they do have questions about low voltage. Is that not right? But they do have questions about low voltage. Yes. Okay, that thank is, you. That is class, that's the voltage level. It has nothing to do with the functionality of an alarm or burglar. Yes, sir, but that's why we exempted that. That's why we exempted those devices out of this, we'll this substitute. And we can't pull the wires, or they can't pull the wires to that. G, they can pull the wires. Well, you agreed to that. Well, I'm just clarifying all right, we, let's let's talk up here. You got I'm, I'm just saying, you know, th let's, this let's. this is this has something that was agreed to, you know, before we, everybody had all of a sudden agreed to it, and so nobody came down today from the, you know, as electricians, you know, to testify. We thought that, you know, that we had this uh, this agreed <laughs> to. I'm just saying that that you know the bill is not that complicated. If you look on talking about the permit process, if you look at line. 56, 57, it already talks about the permit process. I don't think the electricians currently have to go through the per, uh, permit process that they're talking about on low voltage. So I just, I just think that, you know, we're trying to make a complicated uh, 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 position out of, out of this, which, which all we're allowing them to do. When you're talking about the public being confused, yeah, they are confused. I guarantee you. They don't know one license from the other. They are confused. They're confused when you say, I can't wire that doorbell. And then they get really get confused. That's going to cost you another $100. You know, they say that, you know, when, you, when you're talking about uh, alarm systems and you're talking about fire systems, these are specialized systems. If I'm going to get one of those, I'm going to call one of those specialty companies to do it. You know, they... Like I said, the, the burglar alarm people, they, most of the time they'll put them in for free nowadays. Sometimes they'll finance them for you, and they charge eighteen ninety five a month. That's about $240 a year. I can't get an electrician to come in my house and wire a switch for $200, much less, uh, you know, that. So I just don't think it's creating the kind of competition that, uh, that you know, they might be worried about. Uh, it's no, about no. safety, and no, that's no, no. why we exempted and took that out about wiring the devices. We do, we understand that. I understand that, and we need that. Senator, we, we took that out. Address address the committee up here, if you would, please. Uh, we got a couple of questions for you, sir. Okay. Uh, Representative Flood, you have a question. Uh, I do have a question, and I have a motion as well. Okay. Hold one. Oh, I'm sorry, you do have a question. I'm yeah, sorry. I cut you off. Go ahead, sir. The, the, the question, um, uh, Senator, is what's the problem that this bill is trying to resolve? The problem is that um, currently class, it, was, it mainly started out as a class two because a class two license says right on it, as this gentleman will attest to, it says unrestricted, and it's an unrestricted license. So the electricians in class two licenses felt like that. If their license is unrestricted, they should be able to do low voltage wiring. That was a result of the original bill. And then Class 1, which was uh, added on to the bill later on, which is actually uh, residential construction, uh, allows them to pull the wire. When you're building a house, you can, you know, there's a lot of wires built in nowadays, communications, intercom, uh, telephone lines, uh, all that needs to be pulled during construction. And, you know, they're not able to do that, uh, you know, which, again, again, goes back to the public trying to understand why their electrician can't do something, you know, pull that wire. So that was what it was doing, just to help to solve that both in commercial and residential so they'd be able to pull, at least pull the wire for these low-voltage devices and wire low-voltage lighting. Under the current law, an uh, electrician that has a, uh, can, can wire 14,000 volts but can't put in yard lights if they're low voltage. So that just, you know, that, that was the result of the bill. 
Representative Rutledge. Yeah, Senator, um, as far as a, con as a consumer and, and ordering, you know, this service, wouldn't I still be in the same position if, if, I, if an electrician came out and pulled the wire for me, and then I'd have to call a low-voltage guy to come out and hook the system up, when I would think a high-voltage guy could easily hook up those systems while well. he's there. So that's another, you know, problem. I, you know, it seems like to me the fix would be to get these guys to just get a low voltage license. Exactly. That um, you got to you got to look at it from a standpoint that, you know, you're building a house and you want to, you know, get it all done at the same time, and your electrician is out there to do what they're doing with the lighting and all that, and they need to time their pulling of all these wires at the same time. So, you know, that's, that's where this law comes in to help them do that all at once. All right, any additional questions? Right. Yes, sir. Yeah, at the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion. All right, we have no other questions. I don't believe the committee that I see at this time. Uh, let's, let's see what the motion is here, my friend. Yes, sir. What's your motion? I'd like to move the table. Second. Got to move the table. That takes precedence over any other move at this point in time. Uh, any discussion? Well, no discussion. All in favor at this time to move the table of this bill? Aye. Aye. Any opposed table in the bill? All right, Senator, we're going to hold this on the table right now. Thank you, sir. Yeah, motion to thank you, committee members, for this year. I appreciate you. And uh, if you see if you see uh, Carl von Epps, tell him we're going to miss him. Okay, meeting adjourned. Well, we're sorry we missed you everywhere.